Welcome, we're here with Ken Salazar, who is the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. Ambassador Salazar, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Anna, it's my honor to be with you and the Young Turks. I gotta say, uh, I'm loving the hat, I'm loving the tie, you look like you're here to party. I'm here to celebrate with everybody <laughs> in the City of the Angels. All right, well, uh, let's talk a little bit about the summit. Uh, unfortunately, it began with a little bit of controversy after the president of Mexico decided to boycott the summit as a result of the Biden administration refusing to invite uh, a few countries, inc including Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. What are your thoughts on Biden's decision to avoid inviting uh, those specific countries? Yeah, the president is correct. Uh, we do not invite uh, dictators and despots to come to a gathering of uh, democracies. Uh, it would be akin to us inviting Russia to come to a, a meeting that's about the future of the Americas and, and democracy. So the president's decision is correct. But we are not to let this summit be taken away by the question of the invitations, because that's really not what the summit's about. The summit really is about all the Americas. And we have a gathering of most of the countries that are here. And the alignment of the countries, including Mexico, is one that's very good. Uh, Mexico is here. Mexico is being represented by the highest levels of government, and they're going to participate in a way that's going to be very constructive to the results that we'll get here at the summit. So I feel good about where we are. and. Uh, we're going to have a great summit and continue to do the work uh, U.S.-Mexico. You know, it's interesting because uh, the United States loves to mention, you know, dictatorial regimes and its unwillingness to, to work with such countries or governments. But at the same time, as you know, the United States government absolutely does business with dictatorial regimes, uh, authoritarian governments like Saudi Arabia, for instance. And in the case of Venezuela, I mean, just a month or so ago, uh, Biden reached out to uh, Nicolas Maduro and asked for an increase in energy production in order to kind of mitigate the damage that's being done as a result of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. I'll ask you this. I feel that this summit is more about getting politicians and governments together with business interests. It's a little difficult to do that with a communist country like Cuba. Do you think that that has more to do with the decision to avoid inviting Cuba and Venezuela to such a summit? No, I don't. I think where we are here is uh, working on the uh, economic and democratic alignment in the Americas. Uh, you know, in the last uh, 10, 20 years, there, there are fewer democracies now than there were, say, 10 years ago in the world, and uh, fewer democracies in the Western Hemisphere as well. And so for the United States to take a principled position that we're supporting democracies in the Western Hemisphere is a principled position. The future of the Americas is based, in my view, on two fundamental propositions. One is the economic integration, where there is uh, alignment between President Lopez Obrador and President Biden on what we have to do to near shore manufacturing from China and other places here to the Americas. We're integrated in so many ways, from uh, auto manufacturing to lots of different things that we do together. And secondly, the democracies. Uh, we need to help uh, restore democracies that function well. Because when they don't function, when the governments don't function well, and you see the huge dislocation, displacement of millions of people in Venezuela because the government has failed them. So governments have to, have to be held accountable uh, to deliver for their people. You know, some of that displacement um, is definitely shown in the current caravan that's traveling through Mexico. Sure. There are Venezuelans uh, who are part of the more than 6,000 people who have decided to take part in that caravan. And uh, the United States has been very restrictive in regard to its immigration policy, even under the Biden administration. What are your thoughts on that? We have a, an immigration system that is completely broken and it's been broken for a very long time. I was in the U.S. Senator, uh, US Senate working very hard with uh, Senator John McCain and Senator Ted Kennedy on immigration reform back in my time in the Senate. And so this manifestation of a humanitarian crisis that we see on migration across the Americas is because there has been a failure to develop a, an immigration system that is 
human, uh, legal, that is uh, good for all of the different reasons that you have immigration. We're a country of immigrants here. And so one of the outcomes that we hope for here is a change in how we see immigration in the Americas, where we see it as a responsibility of a region. It's not just a United States issue. It's an issue that's United States, Mexico, and the region. And so I expect that one of the most important outcomes of this summit is going to be a commitment by the countries of the Americas, including Mexico, that we're going to work on the migration issues together as a region. I think that will be one of the historic things that will come out of this summit. You previously mentioned uh, how intertwined the United States and Mexican economies are, and you sp specifically mentioned, um, you know, the automobile manufacturing. Uh, and I couldn't help but think about NAFTA, which was then later renegotiated under Trump and renamed. What are your perceptions of the outcomes of NAFTA, particularly the impact that NAFTA had on the agricultural industry in Mexico and also the manufacturing industry here in the United States. We lost manufacturing jobs to Mexico uh, with business interests looking for cheap labor. And we also started um, exporting corn, cheap corn, to Mexico, which devastated agricultural workers there. Have there been any efforts to mitigate that damage? So the USMCA, uh, Temec, as we know it in Mexico, is uh, one of the most modern uh, trade agreements in the history of the world. And there you have protections for workers and workers' rights. You see that manifesting itself all over Mexico today. You have protections for the environment that you didn't have before. And you have other kinds of assistance that will lift up, in our view, as it's being implemented, and we're watching it very closely here in the United States, that will basically address some of the dislocations that happened under the trade agreements of the past. They were very hopeful that we're going to see the kind of development through Mexico, but also the United States, that supports the integration of the economies. You think about clean energy, for example, where there is a great opportunity for Mexico to become a clean energy powerhouse uh, for the Americas. It's required in part because we have now the automotive industry saying that we are moving forward to 100% electromobility. And so the commitments that we're working on with uh, the Americas, but specifically with Mexico here at the summit, are going to further that agenda. It's a, an economic integration. I think how President Biden says it all the time is that we have to grow our economy uh, from the middle out, but also from the bottom up. And when he says that, he's worried about the lower middle class. He's worried about the people who have been left behind by the economic policies of the past. So that's a commitment that we're making here in, uh, in Los Angeles. You mentioned some of the worker protections. Uh, can you be specific about that? What worker protections have been implemented uh, following NAFTA? Yeah, probably the best thing to do is an example. You know, I, So I went to the GM plant in Salau, where they have over 2,000 workers at that GM plant. And there they were negotiating for the first time a new collective bargaining agreement for the workers. And it had a lot of different features to it, but they ended up agreeing on a new collective bargaining agreement that significantly increased the wages of the workers working at that plant, that provided them benefits that had been eluded uh, from the prior arrangements that they had. So the workers are happy and they're doing much better. So yeah, they're, I mean, all over the country, those kinds of uh, efforts are being uh, implemented under USMCA. And I want to pivot to a completely different topic, and it'll be the final topic we discuss, and it has to do with, you know, increasing violence in the United States, but also that violence which ends up being exported to uh, Mexico and other Latin American countries. Gun violence is a huge, huge problem. The easy uh, accessibility of guns is a huge problem, not just domestically in the U.S., but in the form of these guns being smuggled across the border to Mexico, to some of these Latin American countries as well. What would you like to see be done in Congress to kind of help stop the flow of guns to Mexico and other Latin American countries? So I echo what President Biden said today and what he's been saying um, ever since he was in the U.S. Senate. Uh, we need to have better regulation on, on guns in this country. 
you know, the assault weapons that are out there, killing young people as they so heartbrokenly did in uh, Uvalde, Texas, or the shootings that we saw over the weekend. You know, the United States, through our leaders in the Senate, have to wake up to this reality. And there's conversations going on that hopefully will bring about a breakthrough on uh, a legal framework that uh, has been paralyzed in part because the powers that affect the U.S. Senate, the political powers, have basically had them come to paralysis. And in my view, that's wrong. Uh, the president's view is that that's wrong. And so hopefully we'll get some of our laws changed here. On the U.S.-Mexico part of that, uh, you know, the, about 70 percent of the weapons that are killing uh, people in Mexico come from the United States. And so one of the changes that we've made because of the bicentennial security framework that we have with uh, Mexico now is we're working together on firearms trafficking. So if we find, and we are finding them, uh, members of these transnational criminal organizations that are involved in trafficking arms to Mexico, to the cartels, they're going to do the time uh, in prison, both here and in Mexico. So those are the changes that we brought about just in the last several months in Mexico. It's a high priority issue. President Biden, uh, when he was uh, in the White House, spoke about, uh, with Andres Lopez Obrador, spoke about Roosevelt. And uh, Lopez Obrador has spoken about Roosevelt as well. And one of the things that they focus on are the four freedoms of a democracy. Well, one of those freedoms is uh, the right of citizens to be able to live free of fear. Right now, that's not the case. Whether it's a school in Uvalde, Texas, or whether it's uh, stores in Boulder, Colorado, or whether it's uh, places in Mexico. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, that's a keystone for us to be able to ensure that we're going to have a democracy that sustains itself. And final question for you, and I really think that this goes to the heart of everything we've talked about. It has an impact on everything we've talked about. Thoughts on restricting the flow of corporate money into the campaign coffers of our politicians? You know, campaign finance reform needs to happen in this country. Uh, you know, there's uh, when uh, Senator McCain and uh, Senator Feingold passed McCain-Feingold, that was a step in the absolute right direction. You know, the United States uh, Supreme Court took it in a very bad direction under Citizens United. I would hope that somehow uh, there is the courage to rein in what's happening now with the flow of money from not only corporations but from very wealthy people basically can buy elections. That ought not to be a hallmark of democracy anywhere. It ought not to be the hallmark of democracy here. It ought not to be the hallmark of democracy in Mexico or anywhere else around the world. You know, people ought to have a right to vote. It ought to be respected. And money should not buy elections anywhere. Couldn't agree more with you on that one. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, for speaking with me, and I hope that we get an opportunity to speak again. Thank you, Anna, and my very best to you.